So the next speaker is David Orban, and he will talk to us about what the network society actually is in uh, present technological trends and future uh, implications. Um, I want our conversation to keep going after I'm done talking. And please reach out, connect on Facebook, on Twitter, and any other platform, uh, both with me as well as with, uh, with our uh, projects. Um, what I want to talk to you about is the nature of socio-economic uh, evolution. We have seen in the past 50 years what is the power of exponential technologies, the best example of which is Moore's Law. That is really what changed our societies. Uh, my point is that society is not formed uh, for the moral aspirations of its constituents. It achieves its form because of the technological basis that expresses that particular form. If you asked um, an Egyptian slave if his situation was just, obviously the answer would have been no. But if you ask the same slave, is a society without slaves possible? The same slave would have answered, obviously, it is not possible. And that was the same in Roman times or in Greek times. But then, as technology changed, our societies could afford to aspire to achieve more. Our societies could afford to think, is the axiom of slavery something that can be eliminated from our assumptions of how to build a society? And the answer was yes. And we went further. Even if just about 100, 150 years ago, we started our, uh, asking ourselves other things about society and how it should be. Is it right for children to start working at age of 7, 8, 9, 10? or to work in mines at the age of 10 or 12? And we were able to answer that it is not right, not because we became better people, but because technology allowed us to produce uh, the raw materials, the energy needs, the buildings, the food that did not require child labor. And today, we are in a globally connected incredibly complex and ambitious society. And we should ask ourselves the same questions. The assumptions that we followed when we were born and we were taught how society works, are these assumptions still correct? Or should we have the ambition and the courage of starting a conversation around what are the dogmatic axioms that can be eliminated from our social contract as clearly as slavery has been eliminated finally a few hundred years ago. One of the things that we are more and more clear about is that a lot of ways in which society works is unsustainable. And it's once again not that Sustainability was not in the air as a concept, as an ambition uh, a few decades ago, is that we could pretend that unsustainable practices could go on forever. We now realize that unsustainability is unsustainable because we are hitting a brick wall. And we are lazy. I am lazy, I know. I don't know about you, but I know I am lazy. I only do things when they are necessary. We don't have further continents to deploy. We, we went to the Americas. We went to Australia. We went to every possible continent, and we ran out. Maybe Mars. We'll see what we can do on Mars. But for the moment, this is what we have. And the fact that we are caring about what we have is a consequence of having hit our limits. Now, what is important also in our message is that this is an extremely rational approach. We cannot afford to uh, retract into mystical or metaphysical considerations. Really, the only difference between the dinosaurs is, uh, and us 
is that they didn't have telescopes. We have to use our tools of reason. We have to use the tools of science, of theory, experimentation, application in a cycle of virtuous uh, evolution. Because technology is not a zero-sum game, our 10,000-year history uh, of technological civilization proved it. We went from being a few million apes in the savanna to being over 7 billion people who are changing the planet. And we are exploring how our uh, adaptations continually can give more opportunities to build resilient societies. Of course, meeting with uh, really the, the, the constraints and the cages of old type thinking that we have to overcome. We have to break out of those cages. So given this premise that on one hand, social evolution is a function of technological availability, and the fact that after that technological availability is there, social evolution is unstoppable, the network society concept is based on observing what kind of technologies are becoming available today and how they compare with those that governed uh, our enterprises, our cities, our countries for the past few hundred years, where centralized and hierarchical organizations could do a lot. Uh, the fact that we built entire countries of not only tens, but hundreds of millions of people a few of our countries are actually more than a billion people now, and they function is incredible. It is a huge achievement. But we can ask ourselves, and we have to ask ourselves, is there a better way? And we think there is, and it is the way of organizing decentralized and distributed organizations rather than centralized and hierarchical ones. So to summarize, this is the thesis. Widespread economic change can only happen when technological foundations make it sustainable. That we are looking at the emerging of various technologies that are all unified by having a distributed and decentralized nature. And that these are better. They are going to produce more resilient, more flexible, more thriving organizations, whether enterprises, um, cities, states, or the lives of single families or individuals than not other types of organizations. And that as a consequence, there will be huge disruptions and there will be an increasing tension between the existent incumbent types of organizations and the new ones. And as we go through these radical changes, the final stage of this transformation is what we call the network society. So, very concretely and rapidly, I want to go through the eight pillars with that we have identified for the network society. What are the examples of these transformations and the technologies that I'm talking about? And there could be others, of course, but we concentrate on these. And in the back of the room, on those tables, you can see these examples that I'm going to mention right there, tangible. And this is important. In energy, we have solar photovoltaics that allows anybody to take a decision whether they want to use it. And once they do, um, it is not a question of a billion dollar investment, of a 20, 30 year return on that investment, uh, of impacting the environment and the lives of tens or hundreds of thousands of people, but every individual can go and make the decision or corporation on their own and then connect voluntarily in new types of energy supply grids. 3D printing in manufacturing, hydroponics, vertical gardens, even 3D printing of meat in food, uh, personalized health through sensors and our mobile phones that have really um, catalyzed uh, personalized medicine that puts the responsibility on the individual of keeping him or herself healthy. The ability to learn anything, and even better, to start teaching anything, meeting with peers who will appreciate that specific level of understanding and the joint opportunity to go and forge ahead. Finance, 
which is itself a fundamental technology that we love to blame for various crises, whether the, the, the last one or the previous one. And we love to pinpoint and, and, and identify as scapegoats the banking system and the financial system. But if it were not for the evolution of finance, we would not have the kind of worldwide global trade that is so important for what we need to do. And um, the latest evolutions of finance, represented here symbolically by Bitcoin, but more fundamentally enabled by the invention of the blockchain, which we will hear about later today, uh, are giving us uh, the glimpse of incredible changes that are going to happen in this area as well. Trust networks are being built that are enabling people to build societies that are inclusive, emancipating for the individual much better than the uh, uh, violence-based oppressive um, methodology that we thought was the only one available. And of course, one of the biggest challenges of governance and policy, how do we identify, uh, debate, implement, measure, and update the rules that we work with, whether locally or globally. Each of these can be targeted as a fad, and incumbent mainstream media loves to do that. But if we look at these trends together, we can very easily recognize that they constitute a wide and deep wave of unstoppable change. And if if this is true, then the question is easy. Either you can try to ignore it and be swept aside by the wave, or try to understand what is going on and maximize your chances of correctly aligning your strategies in order to be able to apply toolboxes of smart solutions and tactics, whether for your individual lives your corporations, enterprises, or your your nation. And the opportunity is huge. There are billions of people who now, with a smartphone, can be part of this global conversation. We can really give opportunity to um, uncounted brains to join uh, the challenge of finding solutions to our really big problems through getting their hands dirty with applications that have no barriers to entry and spreading their knowledge to create dignity for those who are labeled and identified as unimportant members that can be discarded from society, but building communities that can not find new roots and that can give hope and then give Uh, aspirations to people who can and and otherwise uh, uh, should be desperate and still want to find a purpose in their lives. We have to realize that there are things that will never change. We are in the 31st floor, and if someone decided to drop an object from here, it would fall all the time, even if we did a billion times. But there are other things that are not like that. They are not a natural law. And we have to have the courage of understanding whether what we are doing is optimal or we we can do better. And the fact that this is already happening is demonstrated by how bureaucracies resist change, how they apply things like consumer laws to slow down uh, uh, the type of change, uh, to hide their state of panic, really. And how, as an immune system, ready to tell you, well, you want a nut? I'd rather kill you than let you have a nut. There are now things like the island of Hawaii prohibiting the installation of uh, solar photovoltaics because their laws require these to be interconnected in the grid. The state utility uh, electric uh, company cannot take any more power generated by the solar panels. Solution, no more solar panels. Or like the Food and Drug Administration that is ready to say, uh, like the Vatican, and declare war on 
knowledge because just like uh, Martin Luther translated the Bible so that anybody could access it into German, but it was necessary to have a priesthood to interpret it for you, and a big war erupted as a consequence, now we are in the middle of a war for knowledge. We believe that knowledge should be available to the individual, that we do not need an intermediary to read the sacred text of our DNA. Or, like the New York State federal regulator decided, that implemented the so-called bit license that imposes higher compliance costs for a Bitcoin startups than not a bank. And as a consequence, Bitcoin startups are leaving the state of New York in hordes. Not only that, they are saying, oh, welcome, please log in. By the way, if you are from the state of New York, I cannot even deal with you. And these are very interesting consequences because the future is only what we want to build. So these are examples of organizations that are not ready to be part of the future that we want to build. We have to tell them not to panic, exactly because of, our, of the unstoppability of this. And if they realize that, if they understand that, if it is clear to them as it is clear to us that this can be acted upon so rapidly, there's really no difference between having an idea today and testing it out, whether it is through smartphone uh, development or rapid prot prototyping. At Google X, the development of the first prototype of Google Glass, a very innovative product that met with a high level of resistance and market adoption, and it is now being spun off uh, in, in different areas of applications, for an immersive augmented reality that could be worn every day took one day and a half. One day and a half from concept to first working prototype. That is the power of our imagination and technology today. And we can spread this knowledge to acquire increasing degrees of freedom, increasing amount of choice, and to achieve really unbounded opportunities for everybody together. So the question is only, will you and all of the people around you want to be part of this future together? Thank you.